really love uh, the whole issue of flight and birds. Uh, it's just amazing to me to see them oh, yeah. so, so effortlessly, uh, to be able to just take off, glide, land. We go through a lot of stuff to try to get mechanical things to fly, and the, and, and the beauty associated with it as well. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, you can see a number of different forms there. There's a lot of doves in here. They're a member of a single uh -huh. created kind. And the one with a really long tail. Oh, yeah, the really long tail. Definitely a mating display. That is very attractive to female birds. Oh, is that right? Oh, yeah, definitely. Well, Todd, here's the, the question, because I've been involved with flight. And it's a complex thing. I mean, it's not an easy thing. When we try to take some mechanical thing, you have to have an aerodynamic structure. You have to have a proportion system. You have to have really light wings, uh, control surfaces, all of those things. And, and it took us a long time before we could just get one up. And yet we see the, these creatures, different, very different creatures. That they do have it that naturally. capability. Yeah. Yeah. How do yeah. you see that as a biologist? It's amazing. And it's not just birds. So, so if you're thinking of this in sort of evolutionary terms, you'd have amazing attributes like this you would think would have a single origin, but this one has at least four origins. At least four. So we see powered flight in birds. We see it in bats, which are mammals. We see it in pterodactyls, which are birds or mammals. We see it in insects. You've got at least four times that powered flight originated. Mm -hmm. And then you've got all the gliders, you know, the flying squirrels, the flying frogs, the flying fish, all those things that just sort of glide. They still have the aerodynamics, they just can't keep themselves up. Mm -hmm. And for me, I'm thinking, you know, this is a lot easier to explain if God created the flying things, and that's where flight came from. I don't have to worry about getting all my ailerons right and right. all my aerodynamic things and make sure my wing angles are correct. We don't have to think about that more than four or five or what, however many times in evolution because we just have one origin of flying things on day five of creation. It seems to me a lot simpler way of explaining things. So we obviously have a radical difference here between these two paradigms when it comes to the issue of flight. Yeah. So the conventional paradigm, that ability to fly is still coming out of that one trunk, isn't it? It's got to evolve somehow, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's going to evolve multiple times. It'll evolve in the bats, it has to evolve in the birds. Uh, when the creation model, you just have one origin of flight because God designed things to fly. All of those complex attributes that all have to be right, well, that's because God made them all that way just to be right. So when we look around, we would expect to see possibly multiple created kinds of birds, and that's exactly what we see. So we've seen here, we've got these dwarf geese and this teal, which is kind of like a duck. That's a single created kind. We've got a number of doves in here. Oh, <laughs> just flew through. <laughs> that was awesome. A number of doves in here that are, those are also members of a single created kind. So there's diversity once you have the ability to fly, but the ability to fly isn't the thing that's being generated during that process. It is a unique designed feature of these creatures. So the conventional uh, paradigm would have to somehow come up with the, uh, the, the flight characteristics in various places uh, to bring them to where they are. Yeah, and it's gotta get all of them, right? So it's gotta have all the, it's gotta be light, it's gotta have a big wing surface, it's gotta have some kind of flapping ability. Mm, sure. All that sort of thing has to be all in place before they can start flying. Now they might, and the, and the hypothesis is, you know, they start on trees and they jump off and they start as gliders, and then they learn how to flap their wings and then keep themselves up off the ground. But yeah, flight's a complicated thing. It's an amazing And even thing. when you look at an insect, uh, radically different, of course, from a, you know, from a bird, I've often thought just how complex a mosquito is, that he has the ability oh, yeah. to fly and land, to detect its target, to recognize a threat. All of that built in a tiny uh, little creature. A tiny little creature that barely has a brain, right? Barely <laughs> has a brain. And somehow it can do all those things and still fly. 
Todd, do we have evidence in the fossil record that helps us understand any of this, or does it make it more complicated? Well, that's a good question. So I got, I got one right here. I got a model of a very famous fossil. This is Archaeopteryx, oh, right? Yes, we've seen it. So this, yeah, of course you have. This is from the British Museum, or the original is in the British Museum. Beautiful fossil. It's got beautiful flight feathers on both wings. You can see the beautiful flight feathers on the tail. But you can also see up here on the wings it has claws, which is not something that we have in modern birds. Modern birds don't have claws on their wings. We also see there's a long bony tail, which is also another attribute that's absent in modern birds. They have little stumpy tails. And when you look up really close, you'll see the mouth is full of teeth, which is not something that we see in modern birds. So in fact, in that respect, this thing is more similar to dinosaurs than it is to modern birds. But is it a dinosaur? <laughs> That's the question, right? So the conventional model would say this is the transitional form, or close to it, that leads to birds. Now I've looked at this myself, several different studies on this that have been published, and I can tell you this isn't like Mesohippus, that horse thing that we could say this is part of the horse kind. Uh -huh. This is one of those intermediate forms that has traits of two different created kinds, but it's its own created kind, it's its own separate group. Mm -hmm. So now we can wonder about, well, why does it have these traits of more than one created kind? But it's not really a transition. It's separate from dinosaurs and it's separate from birds. It's different from both. Mm -hmm. It's its own thing. So it's not really what we would think of as a transition, right? There was never a transition there. So it's not a transition. We'd have to call this an intermediate, which is why I like that word intermediate better than I like transition. Because I don't have to imply there was a transition. This is a form of mosaic. That's the term we use for a creature that has different traits from different created kinds. This, however, is its own unique created kind. So that's Archaeopteryx. Yeah. And it obviously has, I mean, I can see here, I mean, these are beautiful feathers that were on uh, this creature. Yeah, we've got multiple fossils of Archaeopteryx oh. showing the feathers. Uh -huh. And they all got those claws on their wings, and they do have those beautiful flight feathers, mm -hmm. very clearly shaped for flying. Now, whether this thing actually flew or not, it might be a glider, we don't really know, because, you know, it's dead. But it definitely has those, those fascinating combination of traits in its own unique created kind. Todd, are there any creatures alive today that we would look at and say that's a mosaic? Sure. Duckbill platypus, right? Oh, yeah. So duckbill platypus got that beak like a bird. Mm -hmm. It's got fur like a mammal. It makes venom like a snake. Oh. It's got all these weird traits all sort of jumbled together into a single critter, which makes it a mosaic, much like Archaeopteryx here is a mosaic. So okay. yeah, they're alive now. Hmm. So. People might look at the um, duck-billed platypus today and say that's a transitional form. Sort of. The way they would phrase it is a stem mammal. Okay. And the stem mammal would mean on the, on the stem that leads to mammals, this is a side branch. Mm -hmm. So they wouldn't necessarily say it's, a, it's the actual transition. There's other things they would use for that. But it's definitely sort of representative of the base of the mammal tree. But, you know, from a creationist perspective, it is its own unique created kind. Mm -hmm. And I can show that again with our analyses. So for me, it's, it's better understood as a mosaic. And the better question is, why does it have traits from multiple created kinds, since it's not really a stem mammal and it's not really a transitional mm -hmm. form? And so that question is, how, how does it have all of those traits? And the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> I wish and I did. that's good. Is it a research topic? Yeah, for it's one a of great our, research topic our... for, for the next generation. So, I've been working on those for years, but I've not gotten a good answer. So we need, we need some students to come along and do that. <laughs>